Winston, thanks for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. So we've all been getting these, well, an absolute ton, actually, of these wrong number scam texts. And at first, I was confused. You know, I just thought, it, well, obviously, the first time I thought it was an actual wrong number. But after the third in a given week, after getting these once every six months, maybe before that, I'm like, okay, something is going on here. And they say something like, hi, Cheryl, can you take my dog to the vet on Tuesday? Or, hey, Mike, good to meet you last week. Let's get together again soon. Are you coming to my party on Friday? And then it just became too obvious that something was going on here. And I wanted to do kind of a, a PSA episode to keep people safe from this scam and maybe give people something to listen to if they're being targeted by these folks, give people something to use as ammo if one of their friends and family is getting wrapped up in this this scam, which is called the pig butchering scam or the Sha Uh You wrote one of these out for a while. You know, I did it in preparation for the interview, but I know you've done this a few times. Tell us a little bit about how these work. Well, primarily the victims of the Shaju Pan scam are Chinese people themselves. Okay, and it's been a very successful scam in China. They've made billions of dollars out of this scam, scamming people. And it really comes from this whole idea of slaughtering the pig. So you raise a pig from a young piglet all the way up until it gets to a big fat slaughtering, you know, age, and then you slaughter it. And that's where the scam name comes from. Because this kind of scam, it's kind of a long game. They start out small, make friends, you know, <clears throat> raise you, so to speak, by constantly uh, in involving themselves in your life, getting you to trust them, and then they start to uh, in interest you in investing in cryptocurrency. Mostly it's cryptocurrency that they do, but there are other ways that they do it too. And get you to a point where you're so happy and so trusting that you're willing to drop a lot of money on this scam. And once they've received that huge amount of money from you, they then, uh, you know, slaughter you, so to speak, and take all your money and run. Now, this was so successful in China that the, the authorities actually started to crack down on it in a big way. And not only did the authorities start to crack down on it, but it became very common knowledge. Okay, uh, to the point where people just weren't falling for this scam anymore because they'd heard about it. So then they started to target uh, the Chinese diaspora abroad. And China has this very interesting kind of uh, situation um, when it comes to scammers. Uh, and I guess we can really trace this back to the whole century of humiliation that China constantly goes on about suffering, you know, at the hands of uh, foreign powers like the British in the Opium Wars and so on and so forth. It's almost accepted within China, in fact, it is accepted, to scam and take advantage of foreigners. But if you start really scam local Chinese people, that's when you get into trouble. But if you scam foreigners, you don't get into trouble. Now, this is relevant because they set up these scam call centers in Cambodia and Laos and, uh, you know, neighboring countries. And the reason they do this is because the internet is not blocked in those countries and it makes them much, it's much easier for them to then go and uh, scam People uh -huh. abroad using, you know, WhatsApp and Line WhatsApp, yeah. and all these other programs, not just WeChat. And of course, it's harder for them to get caught by the Chinese authorities. But they were scamming the local people in China so much that the authorities started to crack down and actually send task, task forces over to uh, capture the people in these different countries. Or they would threaten their families locally and tell them, if you don't stop scamming and if you don't come back to get arrested, then, you know, your families are going to go to jail and so on and so forth. So they... They changed their tactics to no longer target local Chinese people as much and start to target people abroad. Now, in the beginning, they would target the Chinese diaspora because it's, uh, you know, Chinese speaking and the, the majority of the scammers were Chinese speaking. And you may have received voice messages or phone calls where you hear a recorded voice in Chinese. Oh, yeah. This was this scam kind of evolving to target the Chinese diaspora. and. My wife, actually, you know, Chinese uh, living here in the States with me, she got targeted by one of these guys as well. And there's another very interesting twist to all of this. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but we're quite used to being targeted by uh, female, good looking Asian women is usually they yeah. target men abroad. But in China, it's actually the opposite. It's usually handsome men targeting women. It's it's a different, mm. di uh, it's a different thing. So... Um, Anyway, sorry, they, they started to target the diaspora abroad, but then, of course, 
they targeted the diaspora a little bit too much. People got, you know, in the know, so it wasn't working as well. And of course, they can get into trouble if they're targeting Chinese citizens. So they started to move on to foreigners because if they scam foreigners, they're completely um, safe. There will be no repercussions at all from the Chinese government if they target foreign nationals, because the Chinese government, in fact, in a way, encourages this behavior because of the rhetoric, the constant nationalist, xenophobic rhetoric that's going on right now in China. And I've experienced it firsthand in China through various scams. And being able to speak Chinese, I would be there uh, trying to buy something in a shop, in a market, and they try to overcharge, like really overcharge me. And uh, I remember right in the beginning when I was in China, I was trying to buy just a hat from a, a vendor. And the guy tried to charge me 10 times the price of what it normally is. And I heard another Chinese person come into the shop and he offered the price of 10 times less because I could understand Chinese at that point enough to understand. So um, my girlfriend came in and I told him, well, I told her to... Uh, ask the guy, why is he trying to charge me so much? So she started to argue on my behalf. And he said to her, and this is kind of important, he said to her, why are you helping this foreigner? We Chinese need to help each other and stick together, you know, against the foreigners. Mm. So this, this is a mentality. And right. I'm explaining this because it's important. There are no repercussions when you scam foreigners. So that's why it's safe for these scammers to um, scam foreigners. And that's why they've gone to this, uh, these great lengths of getting people who can speak English, hiring people and real people. It's not just some guy sitting there on a keyboard. They'll get young, pretty girls and they'll get, you know, women and, and uh, normal people that can speak English to actually, you know, start these scams. And they pay them, of course. They're like paid actors working for the scammers. So that's why you're starting to see an uptick in this stuff. Yeah, for me, it's always been an Asian woman, not always Chinese in the photos, but definitely Chinese. And I know you mentioned this in your video as well. So they'll inevitably send photos, usually, well, always, actually, without me even asking, because I don't care. I'm not trying to get a photo of you holding your dog. You know, I'll say, good luck finding the dog. But before I knew it was an obvious scam, I'd say something like, hey, wrong number, but good luck finding your dog. And then minutes later, or an hour later, I get a photo of some cute Korean girl or maybe Chinese using a gazillion Instagram filter or app filters, holding a dog, or they're like, just going to work out, hope your day's going well, and I'm like, why would you text someone else that just already told you this is the wrong number? Mm -hmm. And I think they all think we're into fitness, or it's maybe an easy way to show off their body, because it's like yeah. midriff, tank top, you know, tights, whatever, and they're trying to get the guys hooked. And then they'll be like, I live in New York. You should come to one of my dinner parties. And I'm like, oh, cool. I don't live in New York, but whatever information you obviously have in front of you says that I do because I used to. So I'm like, ah, now I know who leaked my number <laughs> or, or, or whatever. And at first I thought this was Chinese Communist Party intelligence officers trying to honey trap me because that has happened before. I don't know. Is that something that you are that you are comfortable discussing or able to discuss sure. on this the honey trap? Because I know that maybe you have some maybe this is something you have experience with. Oh, well. yeah. No, that's actually happened to me uh, in the past. I have a video about being honey trapped and how they had attempted to honey trap me by uh, wanting to interview me. Um, and oh, yeah, come and come and uh, to this hotel. Here's my hotel room. Come to uh, we'll have an interview in my hotel room and then sending pictures, um, you know, of a very scantily clad, uh, attractive woman showing her bra and so on and being like, come, let's have an interview type thing. Obviously a setup in order to try and uh, do something to me um, and either blackmail me or or try to beat me up or, you know, kidnap me. Or who knows what they're trying to do? But yeah. it was definitely a honey trap thing. That's happened a lot. But you know, uh, when it comes to these scams, they do use pretty women, the pictures of pretty women, of course, just to thirst trap men. That's the whole point of this thing. It's kind of easy. You know, men tend to switch off a lot of the defense mechanisms when there's a pretty girl around. You know, you, you tend to start to kind of relax your, I, I don't just relax and um, maybe you become a lot more gullible. <laughs> so yeah, I think so. Yeah, it but, turns off critical thinking because you might actually, you have a 1% chance that this is real. So you're like, ah, I'm going to yeah. lean into this one because guys are, we think with our, you know what, some, yeah. sometimes. Uh, men, men are stupid when it comes to women. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting <laughs> how that uh, it's switched around. Like I said, it's usually men that target Chinese women 
And they build up a big, long relationship. And like I said, the one with my my wife, I, I actually encouraged her to lead the guy on a little bit. And he used to send her long voice messages because it wasn't just text, you know. Um, in the beginning here, targeting foreigners, it's usually just text because they can't speak English. So they use translation software or whatever the case. But they've gotten to a point now where they're hiring people that can speak English. But anyway, um, with the Chinese side of things, they'll get this guy to talk and say how much um, he feels like uh, she's so kind and and such a, a nice person. And, you know, like they really could be friends and all this kind of stuff. Long, long, long. You can see where it was going. So we played this thing along for quite a while. And I'd listen to the messages as well. And the the tricky tactics that they use, they're, they're very good at being able to take advantage of, say, a lonely uh, uh, woman, you know, with all these sending them like uh, all these complimentary messages. And uh, it even gets to a point where they might send little gifts and things like that if they're in China. You see, they'll buy something on Taobao oh, wow. and send it through and do this kind of thing. And it, it builds up and it builds up to the point where they get them to invest uh, a huge amount of money and then they take it, of course, and leave it. But yes, when they moved into the Western sphere, they realized that the tactic that works the best is to just steal photos, usually from WeChat groups, because people are getting wiser and wiser. They'll, If they see a photo and they're a little bit suspicious, they might do a reverse image, image search on Google to try and see if that photo is like a stock photo or a model's photo or something, right? And... So in order to avoid that, they go to uh, their WeChat friends groups. Because, you know, in WeChat, it's kind of like Twitter or Facebook together. And you have a moments uh, section where people post their everyday life. So, oh, here I'm eating so my, th my Yeah, my this is a Chinese app that's like Facebook plus Twitter yeah. plus PayPal plus TikTok, probably all in one. I don't oh, it's, know. It's how everything. You, you pay your gas yeah. bill through that app. You buy tickets. You... You know, you do everything. You, it's like a like a banking app too. It's everything mm -hmm. all in one, but it's got the section of it called moments. And if you scroll through your moments posts, if you've added somebody as a friend somewhere down the line, you'll see everything they post. And of course, in today's sort of narcissistic social media type setup, you will see everything. People posting their, their breakfast and their lunch and their, oh, I went to the gym or whatever. So you get all these pictures. So they grab them off of there because you can't find those on a reverse image search because it's a closed you know, system, the Chinese WeChat and, and the intranet is kind of closed off. Those those photos don't go anywhere else. So they'll steal from somebody. Or in my case, I did that thing uh, where I um, I scammed the scammer, so to speak, the, the scammer named Salad, that's what she called herself, <laughs> just right. kind of ridiculous. But anyway, um, I found out that the pictures they were using were actually from um, an Instagram model, okay? And... Huh. Uh, in fact, I got contacted by a lawyer asking me to please take down the pictures because the Instagram model's life was being affected by my video. So, of course, I did. I didn't realize that it was a, a real Instagram model. Right. So I blurred her out. But the fact of the matter is they go and they find these photos and they'll start to try and entice you with little bits here and there um, in order to try and build a bond. But the interesting thing, like I said, is that they're starting to use people that can speak English. So they sometimes send voice messages as well, which really just ups the game, so to speak, because you can use translation software all you want. But when you start to speak to someone and when you start to send little video clips and things like that, it really makes it more believable. Yeah, I, I agree. They, these There's a lot of psychology involved here. And you're right. Women make up two thirds of the victims, which surprised me. I, I did not see that coming. I really thought, OK, it's always women chatting me. They must know my number is owned by a male or they're guessing, but probably they know. Uh, that it's um, a guy somehow they they don't know my name or anything So I don't know who or how leak how my number got leaked or if they're just dialing and they assume that I will eventually spill the beans That I'm a guy and then they switch genders based on that I, I really don't know because I haven't taken it that far But yeah, it's a it's a bit of a twist on a romance scam usually with a romance scam though You're talking with somebody and then you're in some pseudo online relationship with them and then they want to come visit you and then it's an emergency and their grandma needs a surgery or there's they need a medical thing for their tooth and then they want to come and visit you but they get robbed on the way to the airport and i know this because a friend of mine her un her uncle what i came back from ukraine this is like 20 years ago i came back from ukraine and there's a guy standing there with a sign that says like Natalia, welcome to America. And I'm like, hey, Jessica, what are you doing here? And she's like, my uncle's girlfriend is coming to visit America. And I was like, uh, I'm like the last guy off the plane because I had a problem 
there's no one else behind me. And she's like, uh oh. And yeah. it turned out it was a romance scam. He had been yeah. sending her money. She got robbed on the way to the airport. He sent her more money for another ticket. And then eventually he was like, this sounds like BS. And she was just like, cool, I'm out. I'm not going to, I'm going to block you and never talk to you again. And he was crushed. Right. Yeah. Um, but this is, this is similar, but it's a little different because the victim is actually, well, thinks they're investing for themselves. You're not sending the scammer money. You're, they're teaching you how to invest in cryptocurrency to make money like they do because they're dropping all these hints like, oh, I'm just driving in my new car. I'm going on this fancy vacation. I'm eating a nice meal. Oh, I'm buying some wine for my wine collection. They want you to go, how are you doing so well? What do you do for work? Oh, I invest in cryptocurrency. Or they'll say, what are your hobbies? And I'll say, uh, basic, basic bit shit, like travel and reading and being outside. And they're like, I like cryptocurrency investing. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, so they're looking for wealthier, more professional victims from the look of it, instead of like single desperate people who are just sitting in front of their computer trying to find their soulmate, so to speak. Well, it, in a way, I mean, it, it is kind of opposite. As you said, a romance scam is all about like, oh no, I need money. Please send me money. The difference is, there's this um, this psychology that goes on, especially with Americans and people from the developed world, when they're talking to um, some like an Asian woman from uh, if it's Thailand or whatever, they have this savior complex where it's like, oh, they're from a poor nation, and you know, like I can swoop in and uh, give them money and help them out. But this scam turns it on that whole idea and that whole psychology on its head because what'll happen is they'll start, like you say dropping hints that they're incredibly wealthy. So they don't come at you like, oh, look, I'm a poor, uh, you know, woman in, in Thailand or China and I need some money and I want, to, I want you to help me come to America or something like that. It's the opposite. They're like, I'm, I'm really rich. I'm jet setting around. I'm the one here who can really come and come down and swoop down and, and take you out of your situation. I know, you know, right. everybody has troubles in life, but I've figured this out. I have a, I like, I go on a yacht or I have a yacht and I have Porsches and what have you. And so people are intrigued. They're like, oh, wow. I wonder how this happened. I wonder if I can get a piece of that. And so it plays into greed rather than lust. It's more of a greed thing. Um, and so what happens is they start to give you advice and be like, oh, now we're becoming friends. Maybe I can teach you how to make some money because it's really easy, you know? And if you're far along enough in this thing where you've kind of gotten involved and uh, you've been hooked and you, you're interested in the person because they've been talking to you for, say, a week or a month, and they're quite clever, if they do it right, they're very clever. They do it very slowly. And they will contact you every day. A guy who was talking to my wife would send her a message every morning. Oh, good morning. I wonder, you know, how are you doing? Did you sleep well? That kind of crap. And they do that as well if they're doing it properly to, to Western people. So they'll uh, really involve themselves in your life. They'll ask you how your day is. They'll speak to you about your troubles. They'll, uh, you know, really build a bond and a friendship. And then as things get more personal and more seemingly personal, where people, you're starting to talk more about your life, they're talking more about, their life, that's when they start to drop all these hints about like, oh, I just flew to wherever, to Cannes to see the film festival, or I just flew here to Barcelona, or I just went to, you know, they make it sound like they're a jet setter, they've got a lot of money, and so it starts to get into that conversation about like, you know, how they earn their money. And that's when you get to the crypto scam side of things. And it's interesting because the, the last one that I played along with and tried my best to just piss them off, really, I kept telling them that I'm a hedge fund manager and I've got investments and I know what I'm doing and I don't trust crypto. That was my whole thing. I said, I don't trust crypto. And they were like, yeah, well, you know, I don't trust crypto either, but my uncle has this method with these short-term crypto investments that actually works very well and takes advantage of the, the, the bearish market that we're seeing right now. You know, they're getting very complicated. Um, and even though I tried my best to tell them that crypto is nonsense, I'm not interested in crypto, they still tried their absolute best to use some jargon and some other nonsense to get me interested in investing in crypto. Interesting. Yeah. And the way they pull it off is even more interesting. Um, and like I said, I played along all the way to the point where I, I, obviously I didn't do it, but I was right at the point where I was going to send the money. So I figured out yeah, how it all works. I... <laughs> I, I saw that. I, I want to jump in for a little bit because the conversation always leads to cryptocurrency investing. Sometimes it's fast the first day if they're sloppy, sometimes slowly over weeks or even months. It depends on 
it seems like it depends on how much money they think you have. If they think you're just like an easy mark, they'll go for it right away. But if they think you're a whale, they're like, okay, maybe I take time, talk about vacations, get this guy. Because if you think about it, if they spend an extra month or two working on you and you invest ten or $25,000 instead of $500, that is well compensated time for somebody who's living in Cambodia or Burma working for an organized crime syndicate. I mean, that is, that's really, uh, that's, that's a job well done. And that you're just one mark. They're probably working a hundred marks at the same time or, you know, 50 or something like that. So if they think you're on the hook, I noticed they will either move you to another app or another number in the same app using some excuse like, oh, this is my private WhatsApp yep. or this is my Telegram. Let's move to Telegram. And, and what I thought was interesting about this, Winston, was that makes me think that they're using they've got a sales organization where there's newbies who don't really know what they're doing, sending scripts out to 10,000 people a week or whatever. And then once you're kind of on the hook, they transfer you to somebody who's a little bit more slick. Their psychology skills are a little better. Their English skills are a little better. Their scripts are a little better. And they're the ones who actually execute the scam. The first guy is essentially a sales development rep. Like they're like the telemarketer that calls you and asks if you want to switch your long distance plan. And then the person you get transferred to, even though they say it's the same person, that's the person who's like, oh, okay, you're going to buy this. All right, here's a real sales guy who's sitting there standing by ready to tell you how to transfer the crypto money. And and to, to clarify, you, you strung salad. Yes, you heard that right. Salad <laughs> along for what was it, like two plus months or something yeah. like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's exactly as you say, the, the person that I first started talking to who contacted me called herself Sarah. And so she sent me the gym pictures and she sent me the usual stuff and, you know, the, all that nonsense to kind of get me on the hook. And I was I wanted to play along. I really was trying to push this as far as I could. So I was acting very gullible. And so when she was talking about crypto investments and stuff, I said, wow, that's so interesting. And, you know, like I would really like to invest. And I, I used a, a picture of an old dude from the internet to pretend like I was kind of a middle-aged old guy in his late fifties, early sixties and an empty nester who had a lot of money to invest. And then she transferred me over to someone else, but she pretended like it was the same person, like you said. She was like, okay, um, you know, I'm going to transfer you to my private number so that we can talk more, you know, and do, you know, be more private and intimate type thing. And when she transferred me over to her private number, suddenly her name was Salad. It's like, hi, I'm Salad. I'm like, isn't your name Sarah? She's like, no, I've always been called Salad. So it was somebody else. And they just got their wires crossed, obviously, with the name and things like that. Because then the picture she sent me of the gym was of another person. So it wasn't even the same person, even though they pretended it was. So you're absolutely right. And the thing is, they're incredibly smart with the crypto scam because they steal your money without you knowing that it's stolen. Um, and right. they can string you along for the longest time. Um, and what they do is... They get you to set up a legitimate account on Coinbase, which I think everybody knows if you're into crypto, Coinbase is just one of those portals where you can buy money. You can use your credit card or you can use actual money to buy cryptocurrency. And from there, you can either keep it in Coinbase or you can transfer it to a crypto wallet and that sort of thing. It's like opening an account at Chase Bank here in the United States or Bank of America. It's a brand name real easy. You kind of log in with a, take a picture of your driver's license. You can use your credit card or you can wire in a hundred bucks and buy Bitcoin and you kind of go, okay, I'm part of the crypto revolution now. Right. And you're generally safe there. And then these guys have figured out a way to get you to make that not, not the case. Yeah. So, so what they do is they get you to create this, um, proper account. So first of all, now it looks legitimate. You've created a Coinbase account. Then they ask you to buy, um, some some USDC, which is a kind of cryptocurrency. Um, it's just US dollar coin is what it's called. And it's right. tied more it's or less to the dollar. Yeah, it's tied yeah. to the dollar. Okay. So they get you to buy that. So far, so good. And then what they get you to do is sign up for their, it's usually they say it's a short term trading platform, crypto trading platform. It's all about short term is what it's called. Now, this is supposed to be their, this is their in, this is their insight. They've got this website, which um, they they use or it belongs to somebody they know or whatever the case, but it's this is the the insider secret that you're getting is access to this website. So they send you and it looks legitimate. Okay, the one that they sent to me was called BTC Box 
dot something. And there is an actual real BTC box. I think it's out of Korea uh, or Japan, one of the two. It's it's legitimate, but this was a fake one. It was a little different. It was like BTC box dot something else, like dot net or dot com slash something. So it was slightly different. You come up there, it looks completely legit legitimate. It's got graphs on it. It looks like, you know, it's got updating things about crypto values. And it looks very uh, professional to the untrained eye. Of course, digging deeper, I started to notice little spelling mistakes here and there that you would never find on a website like that. Um, links that if I were to view the source had Chinese in them, all this kind of stuff. So, of course, uh, mm -hmm. it was a scam site. But most people wouldn't know that because it looks legitimate. And it works legitimately too. You create an account, it sends an email to you for verification. You verify your email address, you know, so you get your account there. And then you have your wallet and a wallet address and all that sort of stuff and all these options to invest and things. It looks very legitimate. So next, what they get you to do is they get you to transfer that USDC uh, cryptocurrency that you bought in Coinbase over to this wallet. Okay. And then once it's in this wallet, on this fake website, it looks like it's there. It's not actually there. They've stolen the money already, right? But then because they have complete control over this website, they change the numbers and stuff to make it look like you're earning a lot of money, a lot of interest on your investment. So say you, they try to get me to put $5,000 down, which I think is a bit ballsy of them to ask somebody to just buy $5,000, Yeah, you know? So I, I talked them down to yeah. $1,000. And then they were like, ah, you can see they're kind of losing interest, but they went along with it anyway, because I told them I had 500000 to invest, but I wanted to test it first, right? So they kind of stuck with me because of that. Mm -hmm. So your money sits in there, and if you were to check your BTC box or whatever they're going to call it, because it'll have a different name every time. If you check your account every day, you're earning like 15%, 10%, 20%. It looks legitimate. It looks like you're earning a lot of money. So you put that $1,000 in. By the end of the week, you've got $1,500 or $1,300 or something in the account. And this encourages you to invest more because this is where the greed takes over. You're like, wow, I'm making so much money. If I put five grand in or 10 grand in, imagine how much returns I could get. And every dollar that you're transferring to that account is being stolen. And that's how it works. And so you have people who keep their money in these fake accounts for months and keep adding and adding and adding, thinking that they're getting a lot of money. And then when they try to draw the money out, they can't. And then they get you with even further scams. Right. They'll be like, yeah, you okay. can't draw the money out because of some exchange uh, issue. You're going to have to send some money to this um, organization or something so that we can facilitate the transfer. So they get even more money out of you when you try to get your money out of the thing. It's quite despicable. And at the end of the day, every cent is gone. Hey, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There's a lot more just like this. You can find the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the show. Right, so the, you're putting your money into this website. You see that it's doubling, but the website is simply being controlled by the scammer on the back end. So if you put in your $5,000, they'll show you that it's now $8,000, and they'll say, wow, the trends are really good now. You should put in some more. But your money is being drained from that wallet, which you have no actual control over anyway. Your Bitcoin or your USDC is gone. They're showing a fake balance. It'd be like if you logged into your Bank of America account and you noticed your money was doubled and then they said, hey, if you want this to keep happening because you won our fancy bank lottery, you can put in 10,000 more dollars and we'll double it until the end of the week, right? It's, it's ridiculous when you think about it happening with a U.S. bank with actual U.S. dollars. But for some reason, with cryptocurrency, people just don't understand it and they think, well, Bitcoin went way up, so why wouldn't USDC get doubled? And the truth is it doesn't, that doesn't make a ton of sense. Even if they explain the scam, it doesn't really make uh, any sense. But they will continually do that. And then, yes, oh, you can't withdraw until the 30th of the month. Oh, look, your money keeps going up so much. You should put in more. Or, oh, you know what? You're not in our VIP tier where you can withdraw more than $100 a day. If you want to withdraw more than $100 a day, which you should because the trends are going down again, you need to put in $1,000. That'll get you to the VIP tier, and then you can withdraw up to $10,000 a day. So then you do that, but then, oh, the government is now making it so that we can't actually transfer your money out or it takes 12, two weeks for us to process this transaction. And you're like, but you didn't tell me that. So you go to customer service on the website and the customer service is of course in on it because they also own the website. And I think this is what trips up a lot of people. The, 
the scammer site is also, or the scammer is also, they're the ones who own the website. So mm. the scammer can say, oh, if you back out now, you're going to cost me money because I, ma I put in money for you or I vouched for you. And the customer service people will tell you that exact same thing. Oh, it's a contest. Your friend helped you do this. They will gaslight you yeah. into putting more money in there. And you will believe them if you've been in a relationship with your scammer for three months by this yeah. point, right? You think you're dating or something like that. And they're behind this whole thing and there's a lot of contests that these fake websites will run you know your friend matches you this and you're in it together but if you if you want to withdraw your money your friend's going to lose 30 percent of their assets and wow they have a hundred thousand dollars in here do you want to do that to your friend you know it's really really advanced and despicable it really is and they're very clever at doing this and this is an evolution of many of the scams that i've myself witnessed and experienced in china it's really if you think about it, it's an extension of the tea house scam or the whiskey bottle scam that you get where, um, I don't know if you want me to explain that to your audience if we got yeah. time. When I went to China, a friend of mine was late for a meeting and he goes, you guys aren't going to believe what just happened to me. Uh, cause he was there before us yeah. and he had been taken advantage of by the tea house scam. Yeah. If you can explain it, tell us, cause this happened to my friend. I'd never heard of this before. It's probably 10 years ago, almost now. Yeah. And it, yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. Well, it, this scam is specifically uh, meant to take advantage of tourists. And when you go to a big city like Shanghai or Beijing or wherever, you're going to one of the big tourist sites like, I don't know, Tiananmen Square or Nanjing Street in Shanghai or something, you, get, you will get approached by uh, usually young women. Not, not always. They can sometimes be middle-aged. In fact, I, I made a video where I got scammed on purpose in Beijing the tea house scam exactly, but I'll just break it down for you very quickly. You get approached by usually young women and they can speak a little bit of English and they will ask to take a photo with you or they'll strike up a conversation in one way or the other. And then they'll pretend that they're also traveling and they would like some company and uh, they know a really good, or they, they know a really good place where you can sit down and have some Chinese tea and they can show you the whole Chinese tea culture type thing. And of course, foreigners are going to fall for this because you think, oh, China, tea is so beautiful, you know, all the history and all that stuff. So they'll take you to the, a place which is owned by their syndicate or their boss or their gang or whatever it is. Um, and they'll take you and sit you down in a private room. And uh, the menu will say something like it's, it's like three or five, $5 for a cup of tea or something like that. It doesn't look bad. But it's worded in Chinese that it's like, yeah, it's 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 five dollars per gram or something. Or there'll be something in there that, you know, if it ever gets down to it, they can just point to it and say, look, it was there on the menu in Chinese. But there's always some trick to mm -hmm. it. And you sit down and they'll open snacks, which you didn't ask for, and they'll do this sort of thing. And at the end of the day, they sit in there drinking. They'll force you to drink with them. And you think you're having a great time. And then this bill for a ridiculous amount of like, a thousand dollars or 800 us dollars or something will arrive and you're like what's going on here this is supposed to be like ten dollars or twenty dollars you know and then they'll coerce you into paying because they'll bring in the heavies and you know you won't be able to leave and they'll make a big thing out of it being a, a misunderstanding and again this this scam has been going on for the longest time targeting ch local chinese people chinese tourists that go there but they've realized that it's actually easier to scam foreigners because of the language barrier. They don't know what to do. They have connections with all the local police anyway, these gangs and these syndicates. So there's never any repercussions for them. Even if the police do get involved, the police will say you must pay or at least pay half or something like that. So they still get their money out. So they've got this tea house scam and it works in very much the same way that you're, you're talking about because the girl that comes in with you or the girls, sometimes it's two, um, that sit down with you they will also pretend to be all shocked, like, oh, why is this so expensive? I didn't think it would be this much. Oh, no, we're in trouble. What am I going to do? And so it makes you, the mark, feel guilty as well and responsible. And, you know, you're going to try and look after them because they're also caught up in this, this terrible situation with you. Meanwhile, they're the ones that are in on it. It gets even worse with the whiskey bottle scam because um, they target, you know, they target foreigners and, you know, walking around at night and the, these streets and like, come, let's have a drink. Let's have a beer and sit down and have a beer. And then they'll be like, I, I really want to drink a, 
uh, a whiskey. Can we share a whiskey? You can have a beer. I'll have a whiskey. And you're like, okay, because on the menu, it's like cheap in these dodgy little bars. And then they'll bring like a, a, a shot of whiskey out. And then they'll be like, oh, but we had to open this very expensive bottle of whiskey in order to pour that one. Now you ask for the whole bottle and it'll be something stupid, mm -hmm. amount, you know, stupid amount of money, like 1400 US dollars or, or something for this bottle of whiskey. Oh my goodness. You know, and uh, there's no, like, if, especially if it's a kind of a nighttime thing and you're out there on the streets at night and this, this pretty girl wants to have a drink with you and you're a dumb, gullible foreigner and you walk into one of these places, you're screwed. There's no way out of it because they'll bring in these thugs that will beat you up if you don't pay. And they'll escort you to the ATM to draw money out if you don't have the money on you or you can't pay. It's it's a really bad thing. But again, they involve that whole guilt, that guilt by association thing. Like the girl will also pretend like, oh, I didn't know or oh no, we're in trouble. I will help you pay, but I only have, you know, this amount of money on me. Please help me, you know. And so you, you get it into that whole sort of emotional guilty kind of setup and it's part of the scam it's part of the psychology yeah this this happened to a friend of mine in ukraine actually he was so excited to go on a date with this girl and i was like i was thrilled for him right I, he was kind of like down on his luck and he went to ukraine and he's like man the girls here are great i met this really friendly girl and he went on a date and they had a great time and then the bill came and then he's like dude this is insane and she i think kind of played dumb at the time i don't remember exactly what the story was but yeah then all these like russian gangsters came out and they're like we have an atm in the corner you can withdraw the money and he was like uh, uh hold on i don't have a working atm and they're like you better find out how to get the money so he called me and he's like dude i have no idea what to do right now and i was like tell them you have to run your credit card because you can't get the money out and they ran his credit card on a friend's machine. And I was like, just call your credit card company and tell them it was a scam. So he did that and he didn't end up having to pay the money. I don't know how they hadn't figured this out. This is almost 20 years ago now. So I think now they would just be like, you know, we're gonna keep your phone or something like that until you figure this out. I don't know. Um, but I remember going around Shanghai and Beijing and there'd be girls in the middle of the road and they'd just look at you and go, want to get a beer? And I thought, this is some amateur shit. Like, you don't even know, like, just lunging at me, want to get a beer. I thought, these are prostitutes for sure. <laughs> and it turns out they were probably scammers. I just yeah. thought, what a sloppy open this is, you know? Yeah. Sometimes they play, play it a little smarter. They usually... It can be a group of people. Sometimes it could be guys and girls together, like sort of pretending to be students and they come up to you like, can you take a photo of us? And, oh, you interesting. know, then they're like, oh, yeah, by the way, we're traveling here too. Uh, maybe we can go sit down and have a coffee together or something. It, and it goes from there. There's all these interesting ways that they try to hook you with this stuff or they say like, oh, I'm I'm a, a student and we're having an art exhibition, you know, my my college or whatever. Come, come take a look at our artworks. So I got approached by that in um, the Forbidden City in Beijing a few times. That's another well-known scam where you go and they just kind of lock you in a room with all this crappy art that you can buy for pennies in China. And then they kind of uh, coerce you into buying this art and they don't really let you leave until you buy something. Oh my God. Thing. So it's quite common, but it's just interesting. I know we're off topic here, but it's interesting to see how many of the same tactics that are used in these Mm -hmm. in your face real tangible scams that happen in you know on the streets of china that i've experienced have moved over into this kind of cryptocurrency slaughter the pig scam which was now being experienced around the entire world we mentioned earlier that they'll use korean photos but they often use directly translated chinese expressions so they'll say something like have you eaten yet chilama is the is what you would say in chinese and it's kind of like, how's it going? You're not supposed to say, well, actually, here's how it's going. It's just like a hello thing. So you see sloppy scammers will almost have like a like leakage of their Chinese culture. In fact, uh, I've gotten these people to admit that they are Chinese before, even though they'll say they're Korean or they're living in Canada or they're not Asian at all. And I'll say, I'll get them to admit that they're Chinese by saying, oh, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure you're Chinese and they'll go, how do you know? And I'll say that I work for the MSS, which is like a Chinese, <laughs> would you say FBI, CIA combination? Yeah, and I'll write it in Chinese. Mm -hmm. I'll write it in Chinese and they will just start freaking out, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, I'm sorry, your job is so good. You're so good for the state or the country. You know, basically like bless you. Uh, <laughs> you're such a champion, mm -hmm. you know, like they'll say all these kinds of things in Chinese back. And I'm like, yeah. And it's just funny sitting there thinking, 
this guy is, is sitting behind the computer going, oh shit, I'm gonna get in so much trouble for doing this. And I will tell you that after I did that the first time, I didn't get one of these scams to my number for months after getting them multiple times for a week. Cause I think they, they, I, they went into the computer, they went to the boss and said, this number belongs to an MSS guy. You better take this crap out of there. And they probably jumped over the table to delete my file oh, because yeah. the last person you want to screw with in an authoritarian regime like China is their internal secret police. Correct. Absolutely right. And it's very easy to figure out if they're Chinese or not. It's just strike up a conversation about Tiananmen Square or something and see what the uh, replies are. But yeah, super easy. Like you say, they all these sayings leak out. Usually they slip up. Like if you look at their profile, it'll, uh, instead of saying, I, hi, I am now using WhatsApp, it'll be in Chinese saying like, or Zheng Zaiyong WhatsApp or something. There'll be Chinese characters. It's very easy to tease this kind of information out of them, especially if you speak Chinese. But look, the majority of these scammers are Chinese. This whole pig butchering scam, it's originated in China and it's run by Chinese gangs. And they, there's a lot of money being made, huge amounts of money. Uh, last year, 2021, they made over $580 million or something like that with this scam. Oh they my make God. S- so much money and they've got so much incentive to do it. So it's, of the time, it'll be uh, a Chinese person on the other side of the of the call. Definitely. That's a lot of money. And that's it's real money that can buy a lot of cover inside Southeast Asia or anywhere for that matter. And earlier, we mentioned that a lot of these scammers are Chinese living abroad. Let's discuss why they are in Burma, Thailand, Cambodia. You mentioned because they're on the border of China, but There's something here. uh, I I spoke with a a journalist named Sam Cooper, episode 677, about money laundering. Essentially, his his take was, and I think he has evidence for this. I don't think it's just theory. Gangsters who get caught scamming or being thugs in China, they go to prison for, let's say, a couple months. And then the internal police, the security police, the MSS, who I was probably posing as uh, probably those guys, they'll say, hey, look, you can stay in prison or we can send you to outside of the country and your agreement is you're going to work for these Tong ga- or whatever gangsters, triads, whatever, and you can leave prison, but you're going to be aimed. Your t- target is now going to be Westerners and we're going to get a little kickback from this gang and you're going to work for them. Or you can just sit here and rot in a Chinese prison. And all these guys are like, wait a minute, I can go live in Burma, Cambodia, Thailand, Canada, maybe even, uh, and just scam people? Sure. It, it <laughs> seems like there's a lot of unsavory criminal elements that are that were in China now operating outside of China because it gets rid of criminals, but also it turns them into elements of unrestricted warfare for the Chinese Communist Party, right? They can generate revenue, weaken the state that they're in that's not China, and they're not China's problem anymore. So it's kind of a win for the Communist Party all around. Yeah, I'd say that's not beyond the realms of imagination. I mean, China does and has been on record. Uh, they use prisoners for all sorts of things. They use prisoners for uh, mining gold in war, war, World of Warcraft, for goodness sake, you know, to sell that back to like nerds the, who can't do in the their video own game? grinding. Okay. <laughs> I did not know that. Wait, so China, prisoners in China are sitting there playing Warcraft and doing like menial yeah, they, tasks so that been, they can sell the. The gold back, yeah. I mean, they, they've done all sorts of things. They use them for like garlic peeling and uh, a lot of tasks that would usually cost money. Um, you know, you'd have to pay a laborer to do. But whole industries in China rely on this free prison labor, uh, and they do all sorts of things. Uh, they also do the fifty cent army stuff on the internet. A lot of prisoners have been co-opted. There are reports that they've been co-opted to go and leave these nasty comments and attack pro. Western YouTubers and stuff and anti-China Western uh, YouTubers and so on or whatever. They could just go on and, and talk crap and do the 50 cent army stuff. So yeah, that's not beyond the realm of imagination. But the biggest reason why they tend to operate outside of China, at least as far as I'm concerned, is, well, number one, to escape the long arm of the law, number one, because usually they would be scamming Chinese people. And that's a big no-no, like I said, in China. If you get caught doing that, you get into a lot of trouble. But if you're outside of China, it's difficult for the Chinese government to do anything about it. Number two, it gives um, the Chinese government, of course, they turn a blind eye to this because it's not their problem anymore. If the scams are coming from outside of China, nobody can blame China for it, right? Or blame the, the 
Chinese society or the, the government for these scams because, oh, it's happening mm -hmm. in Cambodia. It's not within our control. They're kind of endorsed in that way. Uh, and of course, money laundering, free internet access is very important. If you're going to be doing these scams, like I said earlier, you need to have a free internet. And the internet is so censored and so blocked and so controlled within China that it's difficult to pull these things off. It's very easy for them to find out where these scammers are because of their massive control over the internet. So if they're outside of the country, they, they can kind of anonymously, um, you know, continue to do this stuff without the Chinese government being held accountable and, and finding them. But there's another element to this, and that's human trafficking. Um, they yeah. very often trick younger rural people into doing these kinds of jobs. And once they've got them out of the borders of China, you know, there's nothing they can do. So... Uh, recently, we we spoke about this actually um, on one of our shows, but young teenagers, you know, 13, 14 years old, they get convinced into going to do these scamming jobs by being told they're going to get some work abroad or they got some work in a factory or whatever the case, and they get them over the border. And once they're there, they're, they don't have a passport. They don't have any way to get back. They don't have anything to fall back on. And they're kind of enslaved into doing this job. So it's another way of them to control their their scammers, their cheap labor, is to have them in a situation where they're vulnerable and don't have any recourse. Yeah, that that's pretty tragic. Because so it's not just lone thugs exiled from China doing this. It's kids trafficked from rural China to Chinatowns in Cambodia, Burma, for example, and forced into things like scam centers. And I actually looked at photos of some of these scam centers. There are leaked photos from, I guess, people who've escaped from these. And it's gross. It's like a disgusting yeah. third world prison that has a computer lab, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. in there. And the guys are, you know, d bunked up in these gross, gross conditions, barbed wire, stone wall around the place in the middle of the jungle, no air conditioning, you know, just kind of a gross existence. And they're just in there smoking all day and scamming and then they go to bed. And it's it's just extra sad if it's not somebody who's doing that because they feel like they need the money. It's somebody who thought they were going to get a real job and now they can't talk to their parents. It's it's really it's really a shame that that is potentially the case. And there are a lot of victim testimonials, of course, not just from scam victims, but from actual scammers who testified that they were kidnapped or tricked, thinking, like you said, they're going to go do a factory job and they just get locked in this gross existence and they get beaten up or tased if they don't scam or if they try to escape. And there's photos of these guys like, hey, this is me when I got beat up and my legs were broken because I tried to climb the wall and then they tased me and beat me up. I mean, it's it's really it's really hor horrifying. And yeah. the scammers, the, the gangs that run this, you know, they have even if you do escape what the police are for sure getting a kickback. It's not like they don't notice the giant makeshift prison that's been built mm. just outside their town. Yeah, it's, it's all corruption. And of course, the gangs, uh, the triads really kind of control the whole area. So the police wouldn't dare mess with them, you know. Um, and China, it's, it's a weird situation because, you know, China's a very powerful country with a big military and all of that right next door to your neighbor. And the people that are doing these scams are Chinese and they've got connections with the corrupt police over the border. That's how they smuggle the, do the human trafficking and so on. So you know, it's it's a twofold thing. The local police in these smaller uh, developing countries, they do not want to mess with the thugs, first of all, because they're incredibly dangerous, but they also don't want to mess with the thugs because they're Chinese. And if they create too much of an issue with the thugs, it could bring down the might of China, you know, onto them as well. Mm. So it's a, it's a very bad situation. I mean, this is also why you, you see, going back a little bit, um, why sometimes they're very sloppy with their scamming is because they've got massive quotas to fill. So they'll just start throwing out, you know, they, they have to reach a certain quota. So they'll just immediately start within the first day or two days, start talking about crypto just to see if they can get them on the on the line or on the hook, because it's getting harder and harder for them to pull this scam off as people become more and more aware of it. And it's through shows like yours and the videos we do that more and more people are realizing that these are actually very dangerous scams. It's not just some missed number and a pretty... Asian girl who wants to get to know you and, and you know, show you her breakfast or whatever. It's it's really quite a, a big thing that's happening. And the more people that become aware of it, the harder it is to catch anyone. So now they're just throwing the bait out there, just seeing if there are any nibbles at all, rather than trying to invest a lot of time in people, it seems. They seem to be getting a little bit more sloppier. But at the same time, 
I've seen them evolve. The the latest one that I played along, I wasted a month of her time, and it wasn't her <laughs> because she sent voice messages and stuff. Yeah, she had a freaking melt. That must have been so satisfying. She had such a meltdown, cursing at you. It's like just kick back in your chair and be like, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to waste their time. But, you know, the thing is, um, it's evolved to a point where it's it, it really does take it to the next level. She was sending me voice messages in English. She was sending me videos because I was telling her that I lived in L.A. I don't live in L.A., but I was telling her I lived in L.A. So then she decided that it would be a good idea to send me videos of herself in L.A. She said she lives, you know, in L.A. too. So she obviously had, they, they have connections. So obviously it wasn't her, but she had somebody actually film like just the traffic in LA. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm busy driving in LA. Just on their phone, film very quickly and say a couple words or something and sent it to me. Like, look, I'm in LA. Oh, I'm going to Universal Studios this weekend. And she sent me a, a little cell phone clip of a show in Universal Studios. So you see, they're making it more and more believable. If they really think they've got you on the line, they're putting a lot of extra effort into it. So for your average person, you would think this must be a real person. She must be who she says she is. Because look, she's sending me voice messages. She's sending me pictures of her groceries that she's just bought at the Vons, you know. Um, <laughs> she's, she's sending me all this stuff. And most people would think that's legitimate. It's not just some random scammer with, you know, doing Google Translate. It just shows you how much uh, more sophisticated they're getting. Yeah, it, it's, it seems... Like, I think the common rationalization is if this were a scammer, it just doesn't make sense for her to be a scammer because, look, she sent me a photo of her in L.A. They're putting in way too much effort. I'm not some rich guy. But what you forget is even if you make $40,000 a year, you're making, I don't know, 40 times as much as somebody who's in a scam prison. Right. So you are a giant whale, even if you are a 17 year old grocery bagger at the grocery store uh, on your first job, right? you're earning minimum wage. And there is a lot of psychology at play here. They get I've seen uh, news reports from Singapore because it's act Singapore is actually a huge target. They did a bunch of investigative stuff on this. They get training from their scam masters running the office on psychology, which is a lot of it was kind of disturbing because I talk a lot of psychology and persuasion and influence on this podcast. And we've got a whole playlist on persuasion and influence. And a lot of it is rapport building, persuasion, influence, the same stuff that I used to, that I still teach, that I used to talk about a lot more even on this very show, and rapport building techniques. They've got cheat sheets for all types of topics. I remember in your video you said, oh, I like cars, because you do. And mm -hmm. they're like, oh, here's a bunch of detailed information I have about certain types of Porsches and photo banks. The yeah. guy, the scammer who they interviewed in the Singapore news report, he said, yeah, we've got just a huge database of stuff we can go to. If it's travel, there's entire trips through Southeast Asia with talk about and post and send, and we use the same ones, but they're just probably made by people on the ground and or just created by a, a writer and, and with stolen photos. It's really incredible. They really pull out all the stops, and they'll do things like they'll ask to video chat you first, and then when the time comes, they'll come up with excuses. Same thing for meeting up. So th what you'll think is, but they asked to video chat first, so it can't be fake. Why would they have wanted to meet up first or video chat with me first? And the truth is they never planned on doing it. It just yeah. it looks more credible if they don't wait for you to say it and then come up with an excuse. They say it and then come up with an excuse later. It just yeah. looks more credible. It's, it's so convincing, and it really does make you think that you're dealing with a legitimate person. I mean, in my case... Uh, I could quite easily figure out that the the pictures that in this most recent one, the pictures the the girl was sending me, um, it was a girl. She did speak to me, but the ones that she was sending me were of a Korean person because I could spot Korean writing in the backgrounds and and you know on on like her water bottle and stuff like that at the gym. Uh, but she was pretending that she was Chinese. She she actually because I in the beginning I spoke Chinese to her in Chinese as well to say I'm learning Chinese to try and throw off. I actually legitimately didn't want to to deal with this scammer. So I was trying to prove to her, I know what you're up to, but it didn't work. She still kept going, very tenacious. Anyway, um, she said she was Chinese living in LA, but the picture she was sending was of uh, a Korean person. And all the other photos and videos and clips that she sent me did not have this, this Korean woman in it. There would be like glimpses of, okay, there's a woman's hand or something, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not the, the person in the pictures. 
So, uh, yeah, it's, it's sophisticated. They obviously have, like you say, a huge database. And because I know how the Chinese diaspora works, it's very easy for them to ask one of their friends to just take a, a video for them, you know, or even just go steal a, a video clip off of one of their friends' moments that they know or somebody that they know who's living in the States. Uh, it depends, depending on where they are. So, yeah, it's, in, it's incredibly uh, interesting and it's, it's very devious the way they do this. So what's the best thing to do? Block and stop responding or never respond and just immediately block? I worry about validating my contact info and they go, oh, this is a real number with a real person. I'm just going to try a different angle in two weeks. Absolutely. Um, the best, absolute best thing you can do is just block them and not respond because they're building up a database. And when they see that there's a response, like you say, you're validating that you're a real contact then they will sell that information off because that's also how they make money. They'll sell that information off to various different organizations, whether it's marketing or whatever, it doesn't matter because they know you're a real person. This number belongs to someone because it's usually just kind of like a, a, a scattershot method that they use. They just send like two random numbers. You know, they'll have a program and a bot system. I've seen these uh, setups that they have where they'll have like a thousand phones in a room and they're all running scripts on them to just go out there and send messages until they get a hit. Right. So once you've validated that you're a real number, now they're going to pass it on to all their other buddies. If they can't manage to scam you, they'll sell your information on. So absolutely. If it says, hi, Mike, this is Moira, long time no speak, and your name is not Mike and you don't know Moira, I'd say just ignore it and block it and report it as spam if you have that option in your phone. Because if you start to talk to them, it's just going to be like a, a never ending thing. And the other thing that you can do, like what you did to say that you're MSS, is to have a prepared Chinese phrase that basically tells them that you know they're a scammer, get lost, uh, you're reporting them to the police or something like that, and then they won't contact you. You know what, what we should do after this, after mm -hmm. we record here, send me a text that I can put in the show notes, and okay. we'll just people can just copy and paste it right from the show notes. This is something like, you, you know, I don't know, you're texting a Chinese person, my uncle works for the police and the Chinese Communist Party, screw off and remove my number right now or I'm going to report you. Something or yeah. whatever we decide is the most effective. We can talk post show. But I would love for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to go and get that. And then yeah. they're just totally confused, right? Because they get this from everyone. And yeah. they it, and also look, if 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 it gets rid of them and they remove a few hundred or a few thousand numbers before they realize that we've duped them, then we've won there as well. In my oh, yeah, opinion. absolutely. I think that's an incredibly effective method because they are they feel completely safe. Like I said, there are no repercussions for them to um, scam foreigners. And like I said, it's encouraged by the rhetoric of the government right now. It has always been encouraged to treat foreigners as uh, something different. It's an us versus them type of thing. Um, and so I've experienced it myself many times during the 14 years I lived in China, where you'll get the, the local, the local populace will gang up on a foreigner, even if there's a, a local person that's done something wrong, they will still take his side because you're a foreigner, you know, and they're Chinese. So they have to stick together type thing. It's, it's kind of built into society there. That's what the communist party has been um, brainwashing people to believe for the longest time that foreigners are there to humiliate Chinese and uh, they're, they're always trying to put him down and that type of thing, which of course is nonsense, but that's what's built into the mindset. So they do not face any repercussions whatsoever from the Chinese government and the police. And there's no way that somebody sitting in New York or whatever can can somehow affect somebody sitting in Cambodia or Laos or wherever it is in Burma in one of these scam call centers. There's nothing you can do, right? But if they think mm -hmm. that the Chinese government is involved and the Chinese government disapproves of what they're doing, that's a different story. That's when they will start to actually worry, you know, and that, that security blanket will be ripped off. So that's probably a good idea to have a message in Chinese that uh, gives them a bit of a fright. Yeah, I love this idea. Winston, we'll have to have you back on the show. I watch all of your videos on China. I have for years. There's lots of stuff we can talk about next time as well. But uh, I'm glad we did this PSA. Thank you so much for coming on, man. Thank you for having me. I'm also a big fan of your show, and I'm, I feel honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks for checking out this entire episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're interested in exploring this topic further, check out The Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. 
There, we dive even deeper on this and many other topics. In the audio podcast, I also close open loops, cover things discussed off camera, off air, and give some parting lessons from our guest. You can find The Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any podcast app, or at jordanharbinger.com. And also, if you found this episode useful, please share it with those you care about. Last but not least, like, comment, and subscribe.